right now, I think we've got Kathy Vogan waiting to come on board and talk and interview her own boss, <laughs> which is the other <laughs> way around from normal. Isn't that what you were just telling us? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yes, I'm Kathy Vogan, uh, the executive producer of CN Live with Consortium News. And usually I'm sitting, uh, you know, on the other side of operations um, and Joe and Elizabeth are on screen doing the interviews. But today our editor in chief has some very important things to say. So I'm going to kind of interview him. He's going to talk, I think, about the history of the extradition and sedition acts. So, Joe, are you there? Can you I'm hear me? here. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Thank you, so, Kathy, very much. I um, just wanted to say, first of all, what a terrific job you do on CN Live as our executive producer. Uh, we have our last video as an interview with Jill Stein and Richard Wolf. I recommend people to go and see it. I also want to thank Alex Hill and Joe Booth and everybody else who's working behind the scenes to make this World Press Freedom Day broadcast uh, possible. Yeah, it was the Espionage Act and the Sedition Acts that I, uh, I've written a piece in Consortium News last week, uh, the first part of a two-part series on the Sedition Act. Coming up this week will be a history of the Espionage Act and how it has ensnared Julian Assange. You know, uh, when you look carefully at the indictment of Assange, the 17 charges under the Espionage Act, which I reread once more, you see what a weak case the government has against him. Basically, they have him on one technical charge that's in the Espionage Act, and that is simply possession and dissemination of classified material. And nobody is arguing that he didn't possess and disseminate classified material given to him by Chelsea Manning. But every time one of us retweets or posts on anywhere on social media or quotes in an article, any WikiLeaks document that was classified and that the US government still considers classified. Therefore, uh, we've also violated the Espionage Act because we're possessing it by downloading it and we've disseminated it by putting it on social media. That's how absurd this charge is and this section E of the US Espionage Act. That's all they have Assange on. Everything else in that indictment is what John Kiriak would call window dressing. For example, they go on at length about him supposedly endangering informants. Now, beside the fact that we know from Mark Davis and from Assange's own lawyers in the, four, in the first four days of his extradition hearing in February, that Assange indeed was working overnight that Friday night. He did an all-nighter to redact the names of informants from the uh, from the publication that was coming out on, on Sunday in The Guardian, in Der Spiegel, and in The New York Times, and that it was the, the, the editors, particularly of The Times and The Guardian, who didn't give a damn about whether those names were in there. There is no law against in revealing the names of informants. It's not listed at the top of the indictment or listed all the statutes that Assange allegedly has violated. All of them are from the Espionage Act, and there's nothing in the Espionage Act about an informant. It's against the law to reveal the name of a covert agent. That's a different law, not in the Espionage Act. Many people might remember the Valerie Plam case of several years ago, where somebody outed her uh, from inside the White House because her husband had written an op-ed in the New York Times saying that one of the key points of the Bush administration's argument for uh, their invasion of Iraq was that some uh, uh, yellow cake had been bought by Iraq from Niger. And uh, <clears throat> Joe Wilson, her husband, debunked that in the Times. And in retaliation, they outed Valerie Plam, who was a covert CIA agent. That's a, that's a crime. Assange uh, redacted as many as he could. And that wasn't a crime, even if some slipped through some names. Plus, uh, the US government has said on the record that they have no knowledge of anyone having been harmed, any informant, by a WikiLeaks publication. So we could just dismiss all of that stuff, paragraphs and paragraphs in the indictment about him revealing names of informants. It's not a crime. And he did what he could to redact them, unlike the editors of the Times and the Guardian. So what are we left in the indictment? We're left with him possessing and disseminating classified information. Journalists have for decades, countless journalists in mainstream media uh, have possessed and disseminated classified information. There is this 
That's the way you do national security reporting. It's done today still in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, CNN. They're doing what they're accusing Assange of doing. And that's why on World Press Freedom Day, it's so important to focus in on this indictment of Julian Assange and what it means for press freedom, not just for Julian Assange and his fate, but for the press, for the media. If the Trump administration gets away with this indictment, if he, they get away with this extradition request, they get away with convicting him and putting him away for the rest of his life, 175 years, they have uh, struck a mortal blow to press freedom. This section of the Espionage Act against possession and dissemination clearly runs up headlong into the U.S. First Amendment. There is definitely a conflict there. On its face, it appears unconstitutional. You can't really have a freedom of the press um, bill uh, in the Bill of Rights. You cannot say in the First Amendment that the press has freedom and we all have freedom of speech and then arrest and prosecute a journalist for practicing journalism, whether he's considered a journalist or not. Ben Weisner, the other day in one of these uh, wonderful uh, video uh, web uh, webcasts that are being done around web World Press Freedom Day, said that uh, whether is a journalist or not is, is immaterial because he, he did conduct as a journalist, what a journalist does. So it doesn't matter whether you think he's a journalist or whatever. And what Julian did was receive classified material from a source and he published it. That's what journalists do. So to go after him, and we've seen a history since the Espionage Act of 1917, there were moments when governments ran up to the, to the line and then pulled back. FDR did this during the war, but never prosecuted a journalist. In the Pentagon Papers case, when Daniel Ellsberg gave uh, the Pentagon Papers to the New York Times, the, uh, the Times, uh, the, sorry, the Attorney General of the Nixon administration issued an injunction against the New York Times to have them stop publishing. That went to the Supreme Court and the court ruled in favor of the New York Times simply because it was considered by the court to be prior restraint. This is completely against the constitution. A government cannot tell a publication beforehand, you cannot publish this, you must stop publishing. This is clearly a violation of the first amendment. However, the ruling in that Pentagon Papers case, a lot of people don't know, is that after publication, the government can prosecute. For what? For possessing and disseminating classified information, what they're going after Julian for. That can be done. In fact, Nixon Justice De uh, Department impaneled a grand jury in Boston, Massachusetts, to possibly indict two New York Times reporters who worked on the Pentagon Papers case. It was only when it was discovered that Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office had been broken into by Nixon's plumbers, to dig up dirt on him, and also that his phone was tapped, that these two New York Times reporters asked the prosecutors whether they had been tapped as well, since they'd been speaking on the phone with Ellsberg, clearly their conversations have been listened into. And it was at that point that the uh, Justice Department of Nixon withdrew this uh, grand jury and it collapsed. So in that case, they did not prosecute a journalist for possession and dissemination, although Nixon came very close to doing it. And then, of course, we know even in Julian Assange's case that the Obama administration was hell bent on getting him. They had a grand jury impaneled in 2010, and it looked at prosecuting Assange for possession and dissemination of classified information. At the end, the Eric Holder, the attorney general of Obama, and Obama decided they wouldn't do it simply because of what they call the New York Times problem, which is what I described here at the beginning, which is that the New York Times does that all the time as well. So if they prosecuted uh, WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, what's to prevent them from prosecuting the New York Times or a subsequent administration? So they could not, could not prosecute Assange because of the principle of the First Amendment. Even though it's still on the books in the Espionage Act, it's not been successfully challenged, in the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. It's there, but uh, the Obama administration had the good sense to not go forward. But let's fast forward to the Trump administration. Of course, they have done that. I believe uh, one of the driving forces with Mike Pompeo, who was CIA director when the Vault 7 releases came out and that infuriated him. That was his, 
infamous quote now about Assange and WikiLeaks being a non-state uh, intelligent, hostile intelligence service, they went ahead and actually indicted him on this. And this is why we have him now on remand in uh, COVID-19 infested Belmarsh prison, awaiting uh, his extradition hearing, which will resume either in July or November. Uh, this is a very, very serious matter. It goes right to the heart of freedom of the press. It's exactly the thing to be talking about on this day. Um, I think the indictment is a weak case because that's all they have on him. As I said, the stuff about informants and anything else is just um, not, not viable because there's no law that he broke there. What they're really doing, and this is what I said in the piece I published last week, is they are actually in essence, trying to prosecute him on a law that doesn't exist anymore. The US had two sedition acts in its history uh, in 1798 and in John Adams president and in 1917 or 18, Woodrow Wilson, uh, when he pushed through the Espionage Act that Assange has been indicted under, he tried to get censorship legal censorship put into the Espionage Act, and he lost by a single vote in the Senate. So that was removed from uh, the draft Espionage Act. So uh, censorship was not legalized, even though possession and dissemination was in there and could be applied to journalists. Censorship was rejected by the Senate and by the press and a large part of the public that was aware of this. So what did Wilson do a year later? He just put together a new Act, which he made as an amendment to the Espionage Act, and that was the Sedition Act of 1918, and thousands of people were thrown into jail. Journalists were prosecuted under that for mostly for opposing the war of the First World War. This was a First World War uh, law, of course, and uh, amongst them was Eugene Debs, who was uh, the leader of the Socialist Party in the U.S., and he was imprisoned, and he actually got up almost a million votes in 1920 presidential election from inside prison. But that law when Wilson left was then repealed just as the 1798 one was repealed by Thomas Jefferson, the new president. He actually uh, refunded the fines that people had paid under that 1798 Sedition Act. And the 1921, the Sedition Act was removed. The UK late, latest Sedition Act was from the 17th century. That was repealed only in 2009, believably, unbelievably. I, found out when I researched this piece. So Britain and the US do not have sedition acts. But why do I say Assange is being charged uh, in essence under an act that doesn't exist anymore? Because they're angry at him for disrespecting government, for embarrassing them, for revealing their crimes. These are the kind of things that you could not say against a monarch, even if it's true. Under that 17th century British act, even if it was true, you could be prosecuted in fact, it was worse. Uh, if, you, if it was true, they were more angry about that. And this brings us to the John Peter Zenger case in colonial America, colonial New York, the province of New York. The governor of New York at that time, William Cosby, was angry at this printed John, uh, Zenger who published some true information against his corruption. The jury that was put in there acquitted Zenger, even though he had broken the law. That's called jury nullification. So even though the law, he did break the law, the jury said, it, we can't stand for this. And that was really the genesis of this First Amendment that is conflicting now with this part of the Espionage Act. So I'd say Assange is being, is being charged on a, flim, on a very, very technical part of the Espionage Act that is unconstitutional in my view. I hope that his lawyers, if he gets to the U.S., I hope he doesn't obviously, but if he does, uh, that that's challenged there uh, and that, in fact, there are two congressmen in the U.S., a senator and a representative who have put forward a bill that would change, that would amend the Espionage Act to exempt journalists, publishers from that section. So it would apply to uh, someone who's not a journalist, but uh, would not apply to journalists. So that probably won't get anywhere in Congress, but it's good to see that two members of Congress have understood how unfair and unconstitutional this part of the Espionage Act is. Excellent, Joe. Thanks for that history. I'd just like to talk about two things that were discussed in court uh, in the first week of Julian's extradition hearings. Now, the first one was uh, Mr. Lewis's address, not to the court, but to the press. 
when he seemed to be saying to the press, don't worry, you're not going to be charged. That seemed to be the underlying message that they were supposed to receive. And unfortunately, they all up and left after that. Um, but why? Why? As Mark Davis said in his talk at Politics in the Pub, if Julian is in jail, uh, the Guardian journalists should be in jail. All those ones in the bunker, the Guardian built the whole interface for the leaks, uh, the search, searchable database. Uh, he said it was all the Guardian's making and, and Julian was just supposed to be the front man. But in fact, uh, he, he does relate, uh, having been there, Mark Davis, in the bunker during all of that preparation, that WikiLeaks had a technical problem. And in fact, it was the New York Times that ended up publishing first. So in fact, in view of the fact that The Guardian, El Pais, uh, New York Times, um, Der Spiegel, they all handled and published the same material, why are they not being prosecuted as well if the Trump administration is so gung-ho against journalists? Or is it just journalists that are called Julian Assange? Well, uh, they shouldn't be prosecuted because, as I said, this uh, should not apply to journalists. So the New York Times, the Guardian, the Spiegel, whatever, should not be prosecuted. One might say, well, they're, they're foreign publications to the U.S. They are in Britain and in Germany. Why, how could you possibly prosecute uh, Guardian journalists under U.S. law? I want to point out that there was a, an amendment to the Espionage Act of 1961 that universalized the, the law. Previous to 61, the way it was written in 1917, the Espionage Act, it, it, this crime of espionage had of uh, possessing and disseminating classified information, along with other parts of the statute, had to be performed on US territory. But a, an event happened in Poland in 1960, I believe, in which a American diplomat was found uh, by Polish security services. Uh, they burst into a bedroom and they found him in bed with another woman who wasn't his wife. And they took photographs and they blackmailed him. They showed him the pictures and said, if you don't give us these classified documents from the embassy in Warsaw, the U.S. embassy, then we're going to, you know, your life will be ruined. This will be in the newspapers tomorrow. So the guy got the documents. That is U.S. territory in the embassy, but he had to bring them out of the embassy to give them to these agents. And he got caught and the U.S. found out who he was. But he couldn't be charged under the Espionage Act because it took place in Polish territory, not in U.S. territory. So that incensed this congressman, or his name I'm forgetting right now, uh, to push hard, and he took four votes, I, I think, to finally amend the, the uh, Espionage Act to say that anywhere in the world, anyone who possesses and disseminates classified information or violates other parts of the Espionage Act can be prosecuted. That's how Julian Assange is in Belmarsh right now. Because the law says that it doesn't matter if you're Australian, doesn't matter if you're doing it in the UK, in Iceland, wherever, it doesn't have to be on US territory. But back to your question, which is um, why aren't they, pro why wouldn't they prosecute? Well, we don't know that they wouldn't. Probably not the Trump administration, although the guy hates the media. He has some good reasons to be critical of the media, but certainly it's really, uh, it's really uh, that he's angry that they attack him personally. It's not about uh, larger issues of the way the corporate media reports things. So that could be dismissed because it is his, his, his focus on himself, but uh, they could go after him and a subsequent administration could after this because the precedent has now been set that a journalist has been indicted under the Espionage Act. I think one reason they wouldn't go after big media is because they are powerful and they could fight back and they've got the public a good part of their reading public, and we're talking about millions of people when you're dealing with the New York Times or CNN, who they, the papers or the TV stations could get their readers on their side and explain, as they're not doing now about Julian, why this is so unfair to, uh, to indict them on uh, publishing classified information. Now, they should be out front and center defending Julian Assange now because of the possibility of them being in the crosshairs at some point in the future, but they aren't because they don't think he's a journalist and they don't really think they're going to go after them. And probably they won't because of their power. They also have tremendous uh, uh, expensive lawyers to fight this. They would bring it to the Supreme Court 
they'd get the public behind them. In a way, it would be good if they did indict the New York Times, because then the Times could bring it to the Supreme Court and maybe have that struck down, even this right-wing court. It could possibly have it struck down, and that would free Julian then, because that's the only thing they have them on. All the rest is, all the rest is crap in the indictment, as I've said. But they won't, and I don't think uh, governments will go after big media for the reasons I laid out. However, there is, um, you know, there is that possibility now. There always was that possibility. As I said, administrations went up right to the edge and then decided not to do it. Trump has, and that was a fundamental difference and a fundamental threat to press freedom. Well, surely, if they're going to be selective about it, those decisions uh, would be made for political reasons. Right, it shows the political nature of this case. Um, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> that's why I say it's sedition. One more thing. It's more sedition than espionage because sedition is an overtly political uh, matter. They can't even argue national security where they can in the espionage matter. Yeah. Um, because there are people who who get documents and give them to uh, adversary or uh, enemy states. This is not what Julian Assange did. This is not a classic espionage case. He didn't take the classified material from Chelsea Manning and give them to an enemy of the United States, unless the public, the government considers the public the enemy of the United States, because that's who Assange gave it to. That's the difference between journalism and espionage really is both trying to get information, secrets, and the spy gives it to their governments and keeps it secret of another, if they steal documents or intelligence from another state, they keep it. Whereas a journalist gets it, gives it to the public that's what Assange did. That's another way to define him as a journalist. He's not an intelligence service. He did once say that this WikiLeaks was the intelligence service of the people, but this is just a, you know, uh, a rhetorical way of describing what WikiLeaks is all about. And of course, this idiot uh, Pompeo used that. It's even in the indictment, I believe, that they sort of, at the beginning in the preamble, say that he called himself and himself an intelligence agency of the people. I mean, this is so ridiculous to take that out of context. He didn't, he's not acting like an intelligence agency. WikiLeaks doesn't. Why? Because they publish it, they give it to the public. That's in the word publish, whereas intelligence services keep it to themselves. So, you know, I, I, I really think that um, it's a great day to talk about this. And I really would hope that mainstream media, uh, they do understand because if you remember on April 11th of last year when Assange was dragged out of the embassy, violating asylum laws and whatnot, even Rachel Maddow got on her TV show and there was nobody on the media who hated Assange more. And she defended him and she said, as hard as it is for me to do this basically, because this is about us in the media, it's our bread and butter you know, publishing classified material. I don't know the last time Rachel Maddow broke a story based on classified material, but in general, she's right that the media does this all the time. And therefore, they couldn't stand for this happening to Assange. The Washington Post and the New York Times had editorials that day saying the same thing. This is going too far, can't do it. But since then, we've heard nothing. They hardly covered the extradition hearing in February. The first day, there was nothing in the Times or the Post. I think the New York Times were one article, I think, during that time. So they've lost interest because, as you say, Kathy, uh, they feel pretty comfortable that it won't go against them, but they understand that they, it could happen to them. Well, something makes me think that it's all to do with whether they're willing or not to go along with perception management. I was just uh, reviewing today uh, when Bob Parry discovered Walter Raymond, the CIA operative who was in charge of perception management for the United States. I mean, that kind of warning like that, where uh, Lewis, who is more or less uh, the prosecutor in uh, Julian Assange's extradition hearing, has the US lawyers sitting behind him. But yeah, curiously, he is addressing the press. And perhaps that it's not so much the high and you know the unions or the, the size of their organization, it really is something to do with whether they will compromise or not, whether they will go along with narratives. As Caitlin Johnson said, he who controls the narrative controls the world. So, you know, uh, something tells me that uh, it's possibly because WikiLeaks won't compromise. And when you reveal all of the raw documents, well, that somewhat short circuits the possibility of 
perception management. But I'd like to just move on to one more thing that we heard in court and you and I were there. So this was something that Edward Fitzgerald uh, uh, brought out, or maybe it was Mark Summers. Yeah, I think it was Mark Summers on that day. So he was talking about the first charge. In fact, he talked about three points that the prosecution were making. But I'd like to focus on this one, which was about the, the first charge, the computer hacking and uh, I think we were all under the impression originally that Chelsea Manning needed to crack a password. Somehow this was in relation to the national security information but what came out in um, the hearing was that this password was actually for video games, movies and video clips for the fellow soldiers because they weren't allowed to install video games on their computers. So in fact, uh, and, and also uh, the, the terminal uh, that Manning had access to and had top secret clearance for, um, there was no login on pa and password. So in fact, that, that uh, conversation between uh, Manning and well, we can presume now that Nathaniel Frank was Assange, was something to keep his fellow soldiers happy. It had absolutely nothing to do with this case. So if that, dis and they have evidence uh, to show this. So if that disintegrates, that means that there's only the espionage charges that are left. And in that case, you have to, Maybe you have to say what source for the goose is source for the gander. If you're going to charge Assange, well, then why not charge the Guardian journalists or, well, the New York Times uh, at any point, but post-61 amendment of the Espionage Act, they could charge the Guardian journalists as well. And they are much more culpable because they built the whole search engine and everything. WikiLeaks, as Mark yeah. Davis said, didn't have the capacity to do that kind of thing. Yeah. And WikiLeaks didn't even publish first. So, you know, they were all, there were many media partners. And I think somehow that warning on the first day by the prosecutor, Mr. Lewis, was somehow warning the press, if you're going to play the game, we won't prosecute you, but as soon as you become defiant of our narratives, our perception management, which has been going on, as Bob Parry pointed out to us, since the 70s, um, then you're in trouble. Would you yeah, agree well, with uh, any of that? I always agree with you, Kath. No, actually, <laughs> uh, I don't. Um, and it was interesting, uh, I didn't answer that part before about why he addressed the press. I, I think that shows that the government is somewhat nervous or quite well aware uh, of the, the way the press initially reacted, that they could be gone after as well. And so he's reassuring them, which was extraordinary in the middle of this hearing to say that to them, not just to them, but for everybody who would report that. Um, so that, that they're very aware of this. Uh, part of their strong argument is Assange is not a journalist, so, you know, he's a hacker, uh, he's not a journalist. That's what the underlying argument is, and that's why they also teamed this with that Computer Fraud and Abuse Act charge, the first one, that is applied to hackers. So this is, they're trying to argue he's a hacker, he's not a journalist, and he sort of hacked in to get these materials. Well, for one reason, I think they won't go after, another reason I think they won't go after the big corporate media, and it's interesting, as you point out, that it was the New York Times that published th that classified material first, and yet the government went after, the second guy I went after, not the first guy, did the exact same thing on a search engine that was built, as you say, by The Guardian. And that's because the corporate media, for a long time now, certainly since the end of the Second World War, but some extent, it may be exceptions during Vietnam, uh, have been covering up U.S. crimes covering up U.S. foreign policy, its real motives. Its motives would be to extend its geostrategic and economic interests and its political dominance of other states around the world. This is, doesn't come through in the reporting in the major U.S. media. Instead, we hear they're spreading democracy. They're, they're taking down dictators, et cetera, et cetera. And they've taken down many uh, democratically elected leaders like Arbenz in Guatemala and uh, Mossadegh in Iran and Allende in Chile, and we could even say uh, Yanukovych in Ukraine. So this is not the way it's portrayed in the major U.S. media. It's portrayed as America doing good for the world, like they really care about people, the people that they bomb and destroy their infrastructure and kill and massacre hundreds of thousands as they did in Iraq. And of course, it was the mainstream media that facilitated that invasion 
by believing all the trumped up um, intelligence before about uh, why the U.S. should invade Iraq. So the corporate media is doing its job for the state. They're doing what they're supposed to do. They're laundering intelligence that would not maybe be believed by the public who could be skeptical of the CIA, for example. But if you if they leak it to the New York Times and the Times publishes it, well, it becomes more credible. That's why I say they're laundering it because it's not directly to the public. So the Times and the other mainstream media does the job that the state wants them to do. And uh, they're useful. As long as they remain useful, they won't be prosecuted. Assange, on the other hand, did exactly the opposite of what corporate media does, which is to reveal those crimes and corruption and the real motives of US foreign policy and US dominance of other states with the raw materials that prove this, not a whisper from an intelligence source in a cafe somewhere in the corner shadows in Washington somewhere or on the phone, but the documents themselves. So they cannot be questioned. We can question New York Times and other reporting when they quote anonymous US intelligence officials, like they recently did on China. China somehow, all of a sudden, clearly the Trump administration wants to go after blame China to deflect attention from the disastrous way Trump has uh, led on the coronavirus crisis. So China is in the crosshairs. And what did New York Times come out with a story saying that China was behind these Facebook posts that, you know, that uh, put out a lie about the U.S. being locked down nationally. Um, and then they say it was, they only quote anonymous officials in the intelligence services. And then there's a paragraph, it's always been that paragraph, like all the Russia Gate stories and now China Gate stories, that the intelligence uh, agents wouldn't give the details of the evidence because it would give up sources and methods. So in other words, take our word for it. And the Times reporters took their word for it. Why? Because it's a big scoop. And, that they, and, and people in government know that journalists live for scoops. They can smell one. It's easy to manipulate them and give them one. So that's why I'm saying the Times and other big media are useful to the intelligence agencies. As long as they remain useful, they can keep on breaking this part of the Espionage Act as long as they want, and they'll never be gone after. And as far as the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act charge, uh, yeah, I was shocked uh, when I was in the courtroom to hear in the public gallery <laughs> Assange's lawyers laying out that he was actually helping Chelsea break a password to download forbidden music videos and games. Now, I don't think that they would say that, Assange's lawyers, if they didn't have the evidence to back that up. So I, I believe them. Uh, I don't think they would put that out in court if they couldn't prove it. So it, it, funny enough, that didn't get a lot of traction, that story. People still believe, as I, as I did and most of us did before, who didn't accept the espionage, uh, who didn't accept that indictment, rather the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act indictment, that he had, that, Assange, that uh, Chelsea had legal access to all these documents. The indictment says this, that she had legal access, she had top secret clearance, but that uh, Assange was trying to help her uh, sign in under an administrative name only to protect her identity, not to get access to the documents. So that's why from the beginning that indictment was rubbish uh, because he was doing what journalists do. You mentioned Bob Perry, the founder, of course, founding editor, the late founding editor of Consorting News, he wrote a piece back in 2010, just went around the time the Obama administration was impaneling that grand jury and thinking of indicting Assange for what Trump ultimately indicted him for. Bob wrote that this is what he did all the time. And of course, Bob Perry, for people who don't know, was one of the best investigative journalists of his generation. He broke some of the biggest Iran-Contra stories about cocaine, Nicaragua transfers, and he quit AP when they spiked his stories because they were protecting the state, very much like that. They were protecting the state, US state interests so Bob quit AP, and then he quit Newsweek because they were also spiking his stories. And he started in 1995 Consorting News, 25 years. We're celebrating our anniversary. Bob did what, what uh, Julian Assange did later. He published classified information that undermined the interests of the U.S. government and the U.S. state. And that's why he felt strong connection, I believe, with Julian Assange and wrote this piece in 2010 in which he said he not only encouraged his source to give more, the crying eyes quote, that they, they seem to criminalize because Assange asked Chelsea for more. Not only did Bob ask him to give him more, <clears throat> he said that he asked him to break the law in order to do that. The law being the taking of the classified documents in order to prevent a larger crime from being committed. So if an analyst, an intelligence analyst takes a classified document, gives it to the press, 
The release of that information curtails a war or prevents a war. That is a crime worth committing. And that's what we whistleblowers do. And Julian was uh, doing that with Chelsea. So um, I see Commander X with your hand up. So I'll, I'll just stop filibustering right now. Hi. Yeah, I want to say a couple of things. <clears throat> um, I'm a hacker. Okay. And damn fucking proud of it. And also, <clears throat> I'm an author. And I'll be dropping my third book that will be in print in July. You can be many things. You can be a fireman and you can be a baker at the same time. And you you can be all of those things and all of those things are legitimate. Um, if I'm a hacker, my consequences and my responsibility, my social responsibility for those actions are separate from my rights to publish as an author. I can't be penalized or my books can't be censored because they describe me hacking. So to me, that, that, whole, that whole thing is really, a, it, it's a non-existent point. It's a, it's a moot point because, and with regard to the CFAA, I am in Mexico right now with political asylum because of a CFAA charge. So let me tell you guys about what the CFAA is really all about. OK, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act has been used in ways they, they have sent researchers to prison for months on charges based on the CFAA. And all these researchers did was aggregate public information, publicly available information and deliver it to the press. And they have gone to jail for it. The CFAA is the espionage law of hackers. And whether anybody wants to acknowledge it or not, maybe everybody thinks or paints hacking or hackers as some big black thing. We are persecuted too. I am here in Mexico to stand for the fucking hackers because we are persecuted too, okay? And like Barrett Brown said in the We Are Legion movie, you know, there are some things that you people, the world, all of you out there listening would never ever know if it weren't for the hackers, because it's stuff that will never be found out by a congressional hearing. It will never be found out by an investigative journalist. It will never be dug up unless one of us goes in there and takes the information and gives it to you. So I want to make crystal clear that whether or not Julian is a hacker, and I'm sorry, but he is, okay? I, I can vouch for the fact because that's how I met him, okay? And that is, that is a moot point to the fact that he's a publisher and a journalist as well. And the CFAA, you can share your Netflix password with another person. And under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, you can be charged with a felony that can earn you five years, no, I'm sorry, two years in prison for sharing a Netflix password, if they were to choose to prosecute you under the CFAA. The CFAA is nothing more than a sword that the prosecutors in the United States of America use against information activists, which covers all of us, hackers, publishers, uh, sources, uh, uh, all of it. It, the whole front of information activism is now under attack and has been for 10 years since we first came to WikiLeaks defense, since the hackers, the hackers were the first people in the world when no one else in the world would stand up for Julian in 2010. The hackers took down PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, one after another. We were costing MasterCard a million dollars a minute three days before Christmas because of Julian Assange. OK, so we've done our part and we've stood the line and we've and, and we paid. We paid an awful price. It's one of the reasons I was run to Mexico, because I was one of the people in charge of that shit. I was one of the people leading that shit and they knew it. And that's that's the reason I'm here, not the CFAA law that they used to try to put me in jail. And that's what the CFAA's purpose is. Its only purpose is to get you to stop what you're doing. 
And so if you're doing research that, for instance, exposes AT&T for having just the most incredibly shoddy material on their newest iPad that they released back in uh, 2008, um, check me on my details, but uh, you know, and you release that to the press and they charge you, you go to prison for two years. That's what the CFAA is about. They wanted that man, that researcher to stop releasing that information because AT&T was embarrassed. They had, a, they had this premier product that the whole world wanted. Obama got one, his daughter got one, and all their data got dumped because of this man's research that he released to the press. And it was AT&T's fault, dead wood AT&T's fault. And yet he was prosecuted. So when they bring the CFAA out, which I was found it very interesting and a little bit kind of an honor that it was the first charge Julian was charged with was the CFAA. That was the first charge they dropped on him. And I think that that's, you know, it, it, it's telling. And it shows that this is, again, they're wielding this sword called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And this law that they're persecuting Julian with, besides the espionage law, is very important. It has killed people. It has killed friends of ours, friends of mine and Julian's. Aaron Schwartz hung himself, one of the most brilliant fucking men ever to live in our lifetime, literally on the fucking planet. He invented Reddit at the age of 15, okay, and founded it. Good God Almighty, he invented RSS at the age of 13, the feeds that we use. And he hung himself in a fucking room alone in New York because of the CFAA and the persecution, how they will go after your family. They went after mine. They'll go after your friends. These motherfuckers are the Gestapo. That's what they are. And the CFAA is just one of many tools that they can whip open their book and, and use these blue laws or these archaic um, laws. The CFAA is very archaic. It was written in the 80s. Um, and they can use these, these laws. They keep them on the books on purpose, even though they know they're deprecated laws. And that way they can use them as, the, as a weapon against whatever political, in this case, it's information activists. The CFAA is very useful. Um, but we have a running joke amongst hackers, man. Basically, if you buy a computer and turn it on, you just broke the CFAA. They, it, it could come with an indictment under the lid. They could just give you one with the computer and say, you've now been indicted. Just send this in when you turn the fucking thing on. That's how easy it is to break the CFAA, break that law. So that is, uh, again, it's indicative of, 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 of where Julian stands. There is nothing wrong, nothing wrong with being in favor of free access to information and saying that, 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 that there is a cause behind WikiLeaks. There is a political movement behind WikiLeaks and the hackers are front and center part of it. They're a good part of it, a part that can be people, there are heroes. Jeremy Hammond, half the leaks on WikiLeaks belong to a friend of mine named Jeremy Hammond who's doing 10 years for getting those secrets and putting them 10 years. He's still, he just got out of the grand jury thing and he's still finishing his sentence. We never hear him talk about why, because he's a street anarchist with dreadlocks because he's, because he used to go around breaking Starbucks windows before he started breaking servers. Look, look man, you know, judge not lest ye be the one who has to fucking resist someday. That's all I've got to say. Don't, don't judge the parts of the movement. Um, and, and that may seem a little dark or whatever. Hacking is, the hackers I know are heroes, straight up. And, and oh, the, world, the world has been so dramatically changed because of, and they knew, all of us are very smart men. We knew going into this, that we were gonna face these charges, that we were gonna face this hideous persecution. 10 years, they spent millions of dollars. They chased me across three countries because of my defense of WikiLeaks. My, so my point that's was that, is, uh, and I just wanted to put that out there. I, you know, yeah, that's fine. Uh, my point was that Assange was not uh, charged in that first indictment for hacking. He was trying to help Chelsea sign in under a different name to protect her identity. Uh, that's what the indictment says, and the, the investigators are angry because that would make it harder for them to find out who had done this. Not hacking. In fact, the word hacking doesn't appear anywhere in that indictment, even though it did on the Justice Department release. 
Because that's, well, I that thought I heard you say it. I thought I heard you say it earlier, but I think really the point where you hit on is it's a smear to attempt. And yeah. this is why I'm being so vehement about this, because it's an attempt to, first of all, it's an assumption, a social assumption that hackers are the bad guys and we're fucking not. OK, and then going with that social assumption again, what Kathy was saying, who, who writes the narrative, right? So the narrative is that we're the bad guys. We're the shitheads. Right. So the way to smear shit on him is to stick a CFAA charge. I don't actually think they give a shit about that charge. And that would be the first one they negotiate off the table when they start, if they ever have to start talking about, about legal um, plea bargaining or anything like that. It'll be the first one to go. It's a shit charge. It's there for one reason only, because they can, number one. And number two, because it smears him as a hacker. Well, guess what? He's a hacker. So you, you, you wasted your time. You didn't need the CFAA charge. Right, I could have told you that myself. But he he may in the, in regards of his past, he was not charged with hacking in this case. This was Chelsea Manning who freely gave the material to him. That's the point I was making. No, well, it's the hacking law. I mean, it's it, it, none, right, nobody. But, no, you know, I mean, the, the researcher that, that that did that research on AT and T um, and gave it to uh, Vice Magazine. Uh, you know, he didn't uh, he, he didn't do any hacking either. None at all. There was literally zero penetration. He did it all in a browser with publicly available addresses and, and aggregated that information. And it was just shitty security on AT&T's part to put that all on a public web server. And it was very, very embarrassing. But he did months and months in prison before that, that charge was finally overturned on a technicality, not even on the merits of the case. And the judge scratched his head. He's like, I can't believe that this made it into my appeals court. I wish I could rule on the rest of it. He, he even said, he said, I wish I could rule on the rest of how ridiculous this case is, the CFAA case. But I just wanted to make clear that it's a hacking charge and it's meant to smear him, not meant to. I don't believe that they have any worry or concern about source. I, that, that's not why that charge was in there. That charge was put in there for one reason, one reason only, because they knew they could and because they knew that it, it, it's, it's a smear on Julian to call him a hacker. And rather than dodge around that and try to dance circles around that i would rather just say straight up okay he's a fucking hacker you know what and we're the good guys so tough shit and that's a shitty fucking law and it's the reason i'm here in mexico and guess what the mexican government agreed with me the mexican government took a very careful look at the computer fraud and abuse that because that's why i'm here and they 100 percent agreed with me that this law is a almost universally used for political reasons. So therefore, just being charged with it, they considered to be ipso facto evidence that I needed asylum, okay? And number two, that there's no possible way you could beat the charge. It is literally, physically, it's just impossible to beat a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act charge. Nobody has ever beaten one. That's why Aaron hung himself, okay? And so if they push it to the limit, nobody, you can't beat it. And that's why Jeremy's in there. Jeremy's also un, uh, under Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So, and he did do network penetration. So it's just this vast thing. Like I said, you can trade a network's password and you'll be a, a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act vic, uh, victim or, you know, prosecutor. So um, I, I just, I don't know. I just think that honesty beats everything and Let's just push forward. Julian's rights stand no matter what he did. It wouldn't matter what he had done in his past, whether he was a drunkard, whether he got parking tickets, uh, you know, whether he smoked pot in the 60s. It wouldn't have fucking mattered. None of that shit fucking matters. What matters is that he's a publisher and a journalist facing the most obvious and dire attack by empire in human history. Never have we seen a contest like this where we see whole Western nations, a whole Western empire arrayed against a single fucking man. And as somebody who has fought the empire single-handedly myself, I can tell you that that's, you know, that's, it, it's, it's incredibly courageous, first of all, and it's, it, it takes almost a death wish, really, to, to, to push through to the end, to the very, very end, to not ever give up. And this is what we need to focus on. This is what's going to free Julian, is focusing on the fact that there's a single man against this vast fucking empire. Um, we can't let a single individual be a sacrifice to liberty. We just can't. We can't do that. You know, it, it, individual 
life has to mean something. It has to mean something. Um, sovereignty and nations and laws and fucking ink stains on old books that they call religion. All of that shit has to give way to the individual human. It has to, or else I will not relent. I will, I will resist this world to my dying breath if a single individual can't get all his rights just to convenience the state. It's just unacceptable. And that to me is the, the, the focus of this argument. The, the legal stuff is all icing on the cake. I think the espionage charge is the beef of it. That's the thing to focus on. And I think we should be crystal clear that the CFAA charge is bogus, that there are a lot of victims of this charge that people should resonate with when they consider Julian CFAA beef. You should also resonate with a lot of people who have been victims of this particular law and they stand in solidarity with Julian. And we should put it aside because it's a smear designed to tell us something we already know. Sorry. Thank you, I Mr. Just, X. Thank you, Joe, for, for the comments and everything. I just wanted to give a hacker's perspective because you were throwing the hacker thing and the CFAA thing around a lot there. And I just wanted to say that there's actually one on the show. So maybe That's I'll uh, say my piece. Very good. Yeah, well, we certainly haven't forgotten Operation Payback and all of the other amazing discoveries, uh, even about the H.B. Gary um, project. He's in my book. He's in my book. And you know what? He has a very particular hatred for me. That's very funny. He oh, I'm sure he does. He, really did, he considers me like his arch nemesis. I'm like, he's like Joker and I'm Batman or the other way around in his mind, I guess. But but uh, he, he's, sure. a, he's a funny dude, man. He's what a... What a what a character. No, I, it's, you know, I, the point is, I, I think we should set it aside because I realize, too, I'm a, I'm a propagandist. I, I, I work with publicity all the time and how to get messages across and everything. And I get that this is not something we should dwell on necessarily. I mean, it's not I don't want to drape uh, Operation Payback across my back and go, hey, look, everybody, we, you know, we hacked MasterCard and Visa for Julian. I mean, that you know, that's not going to gain us. Um, a lot either and I, I'm not that's not where I'm at with it I also I'm not going to hang my head in shame and and I'm not going to have Julian by proxy hang his head in shame um, no uh, but I think this, uh, he he's a whole uh, man and what makes him a genius is the fact that he is a hacker among the many things that he is yeah but you have to put aside this great work I think that uh, many individuals and groups did uh, from the publishing activities, uh, I think you've already said this, of, of, of WikiLeaks. Exactly. Um, they're, they're two different things. And abs what absolutely. And, um, and, and in this particular case, in the case of the Manning matter, the Manning uh, committed what is called the core crime. And Assange is associated by uh, a charge of conspiracy to commit a computer intrusion. So that's whether he was involved in helping Manning get the classified information. So the whole hacking thing does not come in to this at all. It's a smear. Um, it's a smear. They're using it's the CFAA, absolutely, which absolutely. Is an evil law that yes. Ruined other people's lives. I just wanted to make that point. I would also have to uh, remind you as well uh, of what Christine Assange said about the press in Australia. She was. For years, for many, many years, she was constantly having to call the press and ask for modifications, uh, you know, because uh, there was a certain amount of libel going on. I remember at one point in time, I remember there were 13 libel cases that WikiLeaks was engaged in at the same time, which is why they needed funding. Um, but Christine was always having to call the Australian press because they were, in the last interview I did with her, they were constantly calling him a hacker. In order to create that, bias, this is all part of the perception management war. To, to and, and, you know, you have hackers who steal people's uh, credit card numbers. You have ethical hackers well, like, like yourself. You know, the fact that you can get in, uh, you know, past... I mean, to me, a criminal... Absolutely. Is, you know, Jeremy Hammond, I'd like to use... I'd like to flip that, that analogy on his head. Jeremy Hammond could have gone down to Stratford and he could have broken the lock on the fence, broke a window, climbed inside, and taken all of their servers, and he would have served two years in prison. 
but because he took the data over the network, he's doing 10. So you're, yeah. you're, preaching, you're preaching to the choir. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I get it. Oh, I that's get, right. I get that's it. That's right. And what I want to get across to people, though, is for me to step around that smear is to simply step over it and say, yeah, okay, he, he is a hacker and a damn good one. Well, I mean, in and this that, case, that, that we're a very smart man. And you know what? He's a very powerful man. And the other thing that that gentleman, Joe Warrior, was saying, too, about the press and the, and the media organizations and how the big ones would be immune to this sort of thing. Um, you know what? WikiLeaks is really fucking big, too, and powerful. OK, they're not mainstream media. I will never lump them with that. But they're as powerful as mainstream media and they're as big as mainstream media. And they're feared, too. And they have some cards left to play. You know, they're in very good hands with Chris. I happen to know Chris, and I really approved of him getting um, elevated to editor status when Julian couldn't couldn't work anymore. So uh, I really feel super confident that WikiLeaks uh, can can apply the same amount of power. And this is why I'm very optimistic. We're actually going to win this, guys. I think. What do you think? Um, do you think this kind of influence both to you and Joe, this kind of influence that people have uh, over the public, how many people listen to what they're saying, uh, does that have something to do with the selectivity in deciding not to, uh, I mean, I suppose Guardian, New York Times, they have a lot of influence, but one of the things, and I ask Australian politician George Christensen this as well, one of the things that made WikiLeaks a target is that so many people were actually interested in receiving this information. Is that not a critical factor why a lot of people can get away with publishing what they like or saying what they like and other people become a target because it conflicts with this perception management? In my opinion, the target surface of WikiLeaks here, and, and really it is their biggest beef, and, and it is their target surface, is very specifically the idea of publishing raw, unredacted, no, I, I don't mean unredacted, but un, unfiltered, um, classified, secret classified information, secret or private or classified information. Um, in large amounts, and then, and then taking the further step to build tools so that journalists can then go there and use the search engine on the WikiLeaks website and search those leaks, and actually, a, a lot of incredible articles will continue for for decades to come out of just the dumps we already have. So it is the it is the, the taking of that raw data and then delivering it to the press. They know that they can't prosecute the press once the press writes the story on it. What they want to do is shut off the faucet, and where they see the faucet, that the head of the faucet is WikiLeaks. That's what they see is the faucet of these stories. Uh, is the raw data and WikiLeaks has not just made it available, they've made it accessible. They've built tools for journalists to dig in the, into those tool uh, things. Or Actually, uh, I just, as I pointed out, Mark Davis, who was in the bunker, said it was the Guardian. In the case of the Manning leaks, it was the Guardian that built the interface. They, they built the search. Uh, they, they created an item for every uh, every leak. Well, that's I because suppose. Julian didn't have a search engine at the time, and they're pretty hard to build. That's so right, and they gave every engine. single yeah. one of them. The Guardian gave every single one of them a graphic interface, made it searchable, and then they put it online. Um, the other thing is that it was Julian. In terms of redaction, it was Julian who redacted ten thousand documents alone. They all went off to play golf. On the weekend, they didn't apparently care. Uh, Mark Davis describes there the the kind of the graveyard humor Guardian, about victims. However, the difference between WikiLeaks and Guardian, however, is that Guardian went ahead in the minute the UK just even asked them to smash those uh, uh, those drives with sledgehammers. They did it on film. They smashed the fucking drives and 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 ended the whole thing. That's the yeah. difference. They rolled over and died, but that was Snowden's material. However, in this particular context of the Manning case, you have Julian who's doing the redactions single-handedly. And also uh, you've got Manning who is the primary source. He is a whistleblower. There is no hacking involved in this story at all. 
and uh, you know, you may be in, in a I previous agree. life when he was a I teenager, agree. but not yeah, in well. this story. There is no hacking. We have a whistleblower and they are not protected enough. Incidentally, I did a reportage uh, for Unity for Jay on Switzerland when Switzerland were considering, uh, not the whole country, but a local council, were thinking of bringing this to the Federation to ask Julian, to, to offer Julian asylum. And that had previously been refused before because they didn't consider WikiLeaks as defending people's human rights. But then, there was, of course, there's Article 19, which is the right to seek, impart, and receive information, which is something that we all have a right to. But the thing was that what I noticed is that the local council had made a mistake. They were calling Julian a whistleblower. And in the context of the Manning case, Julian's not the whistleblower. He's the goddamn publisher. Of course, we should have rights in the United States, the First Amendment for publishers. But I will acknowledge that there isn't um, Switzerland were acknowledging that there weren't enough rights for whistleblowers. And I guess there's another category, and that is the ethical hackers who, who get in there when it's been absolutely refused the information. And we are very grateful, you know, the public are very grateful for whatever truth they get to know. But in terms of it's WikiLeaks, they are publishing it, not hacking it's it ever. My personal opinion right now, as things stand in this world, and I will be using all the leverage that I have with Julian personally and with WikiLeaks and with Chris when, when Julian is freed, because I know that he will be. And when he's freed, there's only one world leader, guys. And I just want to give a shout out to Mexico. And I just want to point out that there is only one leader that I know of. And I'm pretty savvy in, in world politics. I'm pretty up to date. There's only one leader that has come forth in this world right now within the last few months or so, like new, um, and come out and, 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 and spoken in a, in a manner that makes me quite certain he would give Julian political asylum. Um, I have spoken with the uh, uh, immigration people here about Julian's case, and they have asked me about Julian's case because I'm actually, like I said, I'm claiming persecution. Part of my persecution is because of WikiLeaks, and they've asked me about it. And I fully intend to try to convince Julian and Chris to bring WikiLeaks here to Mexico. And I will walk him into the office to my INM officer because he is the nicest. If he's listening to, shout out, dude, you are the nicest dude in the world, man. I got the best INM officer and he will treat Julian like the, the prince that he is. And um, so I really feel that, that WikiLeaks' future may be here in Latin America still. Um, there are more countries down here than Ecuador, and Mexico is doing a, a right nice job right now of protecting people. They protected Evo Morales. If you go to Wikipedia and you look up list of people to get political asylum, I'm the last one on the list, and Evo Morales is right on top of me. And both of us got it from Mexico, which is kind of cool. So Mexico is the game, guys. And this is what I want to achieve uh, in the long term. I believe WikiLeaks is places here in Latin America. If not here, maybe Brazil with Glenn, that would be okay too. Um, but uh, I, I really feel that they should uh, look here. I think that this is a region of the world that is going to become a bastion of freedom, guys, in the future. Um, there's chaos everywhere. Uh, China is really wrecking Africa bad. We're wrecking the Middle East. The U.S. is wrecking the Middle East. Africa, uh, uh, Europe is uh, just a mess. But Latin America, I think, is heading in a positive direction. I'm living here now, and that's what I see. I see them going in a positive direction. I see people socially active, solving problems, and, and being satisfied, getting, getting satisfaction. So I think that that's a progress. So, um, Kathy, I just want to say it's so great to oh. be on with you again. I haven't been on a video in like what a year with you. So, we were on them all the time back back in the early days, man, together. So, I just want to give a shout out, man. We we we've done a lot of time on this beat, man. Yeah, pleasure. And let's hope that what you envisage um, regarding Mexico could, could ever happen. At the moment, we are terribly concerned about Julian's vulnerability to coronavirus. Uh, in well, that's the only thing that I think can go wrong here. That's the funniest part about this. And I, I think I can be a little bit more honest and open now about my optimism. I was always kind of, it's funny, I was always kind of hesitant to be optimistic on the vigils um, because I didn't want to just, you know, deter anybody from resisting and, and going out there and protesting. But now we can't protest physically. 
Um, all we can do is get online and we got plenty of time to do that. So I can be, I can really tell the truth about what I think is going to happen. And one of the things that, um, you know, I have, I have a lot of friends in, in this movement and um, Lori Love is one of them, a really incredible hacker. When you want to talk about people who uh, went out there and did the heroes uh, work in the hacking field, Lori was one of them. And the U.S. tried to extradite him very recently in the last couple of years to the USA on a CFAA beef. And because he's a dear friend of mine, I followed that case super intimately, as intimately as I'm following Julian's. Um, and I saw the exact same pattern. Um, they were horrible to him in court. They did every decision that they could against him in court. The judge acted mean and gruff. And then when she came out with the decision, what she did is said exactly everything that was right. I mean, everything that we would want to hear, that he was vulnerable. I mean, she literally ruled the exact opposite of the way she was acting in court. OK, so these cats are playing a role. They're playing a, a, a LARP in a way. They're, they're playing an act of, of what they think a judge should be. Right. So in order to be fair, they got to be harsh. You know what I mean? And so all this all this crap. <clears throat> that thing. But I really think that this decision is actually going to come down righteous. Um, and I think, well, look, um, you know, I did speak to uh, Christine Assange about this as well, or she spoke to me about it. You have uh, Laurie Love and um, and Gary McKinnon, who are both British citizens. Julian is not. The other thing is, uh, it seems like not a, bit a US of, citizen. He's what? not a US citizen, but the the British public rallied around those two British citizens that were at risk of extradition in a way that they wouldn't necessarily do for Julian. I'm sorry, I got to contradict you. Lori Love had almost no boots on the ground fucking support, and the online support was maybe as strong as mine. That's about it. He, he really had nothing compared to Julian, and he beat the case, okay? Well, I think Julian's got exactly the opposite, a mile in the other direction, a whole history, 10 years of odious smear from the, the Guardian, for example. Um, but the thing is that uh, Laurie's, the resolution of Laurie's case came the day before Julian's and, and Christine's heart sunk because the good news about that would eclipse the fact that Julian's case was I being- I see it as the good news day. for all of us. I see every one of these victories, even my own asylum, as a victory for all of us that are in trouble right now. And I really think that Lori Love's case is pivotal to understanding what's about to happen. I feel really <laughs> positive about it. I really feel that, uh, that like I said, it's gonna look like hell. And the, the biggest concern I got now is really this fucking virus, which is absolutely 100% real people, okay? If you're asking my opinion, did I hack any secrets or anything? Do I know any conspiracies? No, okay, go home and stay home, okay? It's real and it'll kill you really fast. So um, but I'm worried about that. I'm worried about that too in, in, in the prison. And I think that that's my main concern. And I see it as the only thing that can go wrong right now. We've got all the pressure. We've got the, the, the army online. I love what I'm seeing. I, I love these streams. That's why I'm here tonight, exhausted after 12 hours of streaming and four more to do this afternoon. Um, I'm geeked. I'm, I'm geeked. I'm amped, you know, to be here. Bye-bye. Joe, thank you for, yeah. Joe, lovely bye -bye. to see you again. It was great okay, meeting you in Sydney. Thank you. Bye -bye. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, Good Amanda to you. X. Happy. And uh, big hug, man. I'm really honest to God, it's so good to see you. So good to see you. I'll be. We're, this is the final push. I'm sure we're going to bump heads again soon. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to give up. I, I know you're not going to give up, and that's no. the key. And I and, and I just want. I, I really, even if you disagree with me on an intellectual level, let your heart sing with a little bit of joy because I really, I really, really, and I'm. I'm a pretty good guesser. I don't, I don't, I'm not wrong too much, too often. And I, I think we're going to beat this. We just got to keep doing what we're doing right now. And I, I think we got this licked. And, and so you're a hero. We're, you're all heroes, man. Thanks for letting me crash the party tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So uh, there's one other thing that I'd like to say that I feel is very important. And this is about the, the actual court proceedings. Uh, both Joe Lauria and I were in London. We did a London reportage uh, for the week leading up to that, all the events in, in London. But we also attended a Belmarsh prison and Woolwich Crown Court. And there's two separate problems. One of them, well, mainly to do with the press. 
the court had called for these innovative technical solutions so that Assange's hearing could continue during lockdown. Now, uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, they didn't employ the right technical crew to do that, but we do have a problem where the press were all complaining on the line that they could not understand a word either uh, Edward Fitzgerald or Mr. Lewis, I'm sorry, I've forgotten his first name, was saying neither the defence or the prosecution. Now, this is grave if the press cannot report on what is happening in court, then they can't fulfill their responsibility, their obligation towards the public. Um, what was improvised at the time was a kind of a mic check situation. And in fact, the problem was that there were two speaker phones on either side of Judge Baritza. Now, she could hear both of them, and one of them was the lawyer's line. And the other one was the journalist's line. And the journalists were supposed to be able to hear what was coming out of the speakerphone on the other side of her. And of course, everybody was saying we can't understand a word. Now, in my mind, those proceedings should have been stopped if the press could no longer report, the could not report at all. We all had to rely on the five uh, uh, maximum. I don't know if there was actually five, but there were, well, there was a limit to five members of the press and five people in the public gallery because all the seats have been taped off. So we had to rely on what those people who were physically inside the courtroom were tweeting, but there was a dial-in, and I think there was about 50 journalists, you know, it seemed that way that were, that were coming in. Now, this mic checking situation is that Judge Baritza, first of all, she said, I, I can't understand why you can't understand, like, duh, but she's not a technician. But she decided that she would resume what the defense and prosecution were saying because they couldn't be heard directly. So she did not repeat verbatim. In other words, the defense's arguments could not be heard by the press. And we were only getting it through the filter of Baritza summarizing what the defense had said. Then the clerk of the court started more or less repeating, but even he was extremely difficult to understand. Uh, consortium News were listening in on that, and the whole conference call was, you know, mainly garble, except for the voice of Judge Arbuthnot, who was coming through loud and clear. Uh, sorry, not a, not not a booth nut. It's funny. That's a funny lapsus. But Judge Baratza, her voice was the only one we could actually hear. So I think that in terms of the accessibility of the press to what is going on in this courtroom is a crucial issue. If the press cannot understand what is happening in the courtroom, they have cause for complaint. The other aspect of it is Mr. Assange, who's been in a glass bulletproof glass cage and who has complained that he cannot understand very well, he cannot speak with his lawyers, he's been forbidden. The prosecution even said that they had no objection to being him able to sit beside his lawyers, but it's a refused to have him out of the dock. The problem there is, is of a fair trial, because if a defendant cannot participate properly in a hearing, if he can't hear properly, he said, Mr. Assange said that it was like watching a game of tennis at Wimbledon. He was such a passive spectator instead of an active participant in his case. So that really speaks to whether it is a fair trial in the first place. But certainly the press would have cause for complaint that they can't even report on it for the public. Um, we all heard from John Pelger that um, we were putting a lot of reliance in terms of the English case anyway on Article 4, which says that oh, yes. political offences can't be. Yeah. Craig Murray has written about that and he's explained it quite well. So the extradition treaty between the UK and the US says that no extradition can take place if it is for political reasons. And I think we've been talking about that earlier, about how selective this has been. Why are the other journalists and the media partners who publish the same material not being charged? Mm -hmm. But you have the Extradition Act 
uh, which I believe is 2003. And that, for some reason, doesn't mention political extradition. However, as Craig Murray has pointed out, the extradition treaty must be ratified. Every single part of it must be examined to see whether it can be employed consistently with every other British law. So the fact that the extradition act, British Extradition Act, doesn't mention political extradition, the prosecution are saying that they would prefer to rely on the act, whereas the defense are saying, but hang on a second, you've got the goddamn treaty, which enables extradition or not in the first place, uh, you know, and Judge Baritza seems to be favorable to paying attention to the act that doesn't mention whether you can do it or not. I see. Um, well, um, thank you, Kathy, because I mean, this is an area where I would love to be as informed as you and be able to ask these intelligent questions and, and also even talk about the hacking issues. I, I don't, you know, I don't know enough. And so I am at, you know, your, um, I'm really, really glad that you were able to come and help us with that technically. That's oh, great. No problem. Um, and, we... and also bring Joe with you. That was fantastic. Yeah, so thank well, you we were so there. Much. We were yeah. there. Yeah. And we we experienced it. Um, yeah. it's, a, it's a shambles. It must as, have been uh, surreal. And it's very disappointing <laughs> as a British person to watch what's happened to Britain and the legal system is, 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 is desperate. And uh, I can only feel that they're making a complete mockery of themselves. But um, well, that's right. I mean, the conference call for the for the actual proceedings. I mean, we are doing 100 times better here in, in, in this World Press Freedom Day Zoom. We're actually getting our voices out. OK, bye, Alex. You're off. Thank you so much, Kathy, for fielding that hour for me. Um, I'm really appreciative.